COSA really focuses in on this like pro prohibitionist model, right? Of like the way we protect kids from harm is by isolating them and cutting them off from learning about the world around them. And we actually know that the exact opposite is true. The more kids know about the world around them, the more equipped they are to navigate it safely. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. Today's young people have a lot to deal with. Pandemic interruptions, social isolation, climate change, political polarization, ever-changing technology. And this is all on top of the typical turbulence of adolescence. Studies on youth mental health outcomes show increasing levels of loneliness and hopelessness, proving one thing. The kids are not all right. We all want a silver bullet fix for the youth mental health crisis, and some lawmakers are claiming that they have one. The Kids Online Safety Act, or COSA for short. After failing to gain traction in 2022, this bipartisan bill has been revised and reintroduced by Congress. But like most solutions that claim to solve all of our woes with the stroke of a pen, COSA is too good to be true. If passed, COSA would allow each state attorney general to individually decide what parts of the internet kids can and cannot access. In fact, COSA proponents have even openly admitted that they plan to use COSA to block kids from LGBTQ content online. Now, we at the ACLU, along with other civil rights organizations and parents of queer and trans youth, have spoken out against the bill for all the ways that it overreaches and suppresses our right to free information, targeting LGBTQ people. As anti-LGBTQ plus legislation continues to rise, it's likely that COSA is one of many censorship tools masquerading as a kid safety solution. Joining us today to explain the consequences this bill could have for us all are Evan Greer, director of the digital rights group Fight for the Future, and Cody Vensky, senior policy counsel at the ACLU. Evan, Cody, welcome to At Liberty, and thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Pleasure to be here. So I want to start just with a pretty easy grounding question. The The Kids Online Safety Act is back in Congress after being introduced last year by Senators Richard Blumenthal and Marsha Blackburn. So Cody, can you just start us off here and give us an overview of the bill and its duty of care for digital companies? Yeah. So as the bill's name suggests, it's overall goal is to protect kids online, but it falls short of that in a number of ways. At the core of the bill is one of the key provisions that we have concerns about, which as you mentioned, Kendall, is the duty of care. The duty of care is sort of a broad-based requirement that platforms mitigate a whole series of harms. Some of those are very understandable, and they're classic conduct like unfair and deceptive practices or allowing minors to purchase items that would be illegal for them, like tobacco or alcohol. Others, though, are harder to read as anything other than an imposition on platform to get rid of speech that uh, the legislator has decided it doesn't like. And that includes speech that supposedly causes anxiety or depression. Now, you might be saying, I would love to be free of anxiety or depression. But the problem is, is for a good reason, the First Amendment protects speech even when the government is seeking to target it for its impact. For example, very easy for a uh, policymaker with a political agenda to say, you know what, all this talk about climate change, it's really harming kids' mental health. And by the way, studies have shown over and over again that politically contentious topics like climate change drive youth anxiety. Consequently, the idea of mitigating the harms for, of anxiety or depression from speech is one, uh, unconstitutional, and two, a bad policy idea because of the harms uh, that would allow the government to impose on people who are seeking to engage in the democratic process. Now, that's not all there is to COSA. There are other provisions that are really focused on providing tools to, to youth to control their online experiences. And we think that's a much better way to go about solving the, the harms that you identified at the top, Kendall. But in the meantime, that duty of care is highly problematic. And as my understanding goes, this is an updated version of the bill. What has changed here, Evan? Yeah, so a number of things have changed with COSA, but unfortunately, 
the fundamental problems with this bill, the things that make it a censorship bill rather than a safety bill, are still intact. So COSA's duty of care, which Cody was just describing, um, originally was kind of wildly broad, just sort of a blank check for the government to say, if harm occurs, we are going to hold your platform liable for it. And again, that sounds very reasonable on its face, right? Shouldn't we want to hold big corporations accountable for the harm that they cause? Unfortunately, COSA, rather than kind of regulating the companies, really sort of goes off the rails in trying to regulate the actual speech that users post on these platforms by requiring platforms to remove or suppress speech that an attorney general could argue leads to these types of enumerated harms. So while the changes that have been made to COSA have now narrowed that duty of care to say that it only applies if the content recommended leads to the specific mental health outcomes of anxiety, depression, eating disorders, substance abuse, or sexual exploitation. But the problem, as Cody just described, is that an attorney general can still argue any type of content they want leads to those types of harms. And the bill basically says that their arguments are supposed to be evidence-based, but unfortunately, there's no meaningful legal definition of that term. So in the end, COSA is a bill that says the government can tell platforms what speech they can show to which users. So not really thinking through what is the real root of these problems and how can we solve them rather than just trying to control what kids are talking and thinking and seeing uh, about on the internet. That was a really helpful context for both of you. So thank you for that. What are the explicitly discussed motivating factors behind this bill? Are there other specific concerns that we've heard from the bill's sponsors or supporters in terms of problems that it's aiming to fix? Yeah, I think there are a myriad of harms that are addressed by the whole variety of folks who support this bill. Some of the more common ones we hear are stories about how youth will pursue something that's rather benign online, such as looking up healthy recipes or quick workout tips, and instead are delivered uh, material related to anorexia or eating disorders that are amplified by algorithms. And I often hear as a response to our criticisms about the duty of care and its potentially broad-reaching harms is this is really about the algorithms. And although I appreciate the focus on the way that certain kinds of content might be amplified, I want to underscore that the duty of care when you sit down and read it doesn't include any sort of limitations on its language. Whereas if you turn the page in the bill to the next section that provides some tools to youth, there really are tools in the bill focused on algorithms, opting out, controlling how your personal information is used. The duty of care is silent and all that. It really reaches much, much further, and it's hard to see it as anything other than, as Evan was putting it, a sort of prohibition on certain kinds of speech. I think what's hard here, and I think what is hard even about the name of it, the Kids Online Safety Act, is that it, it can be it can seem really attractive. Um, I think we're witnessing an interesting convergence in its supporters. We've mentioned it's a bipartisan bill. You probably also have some very well-intentioned parents concerned about safety. You also have conservative party members campaigning against big tech who are potentially mad about how they felt censored in their access to get their points across or even healthcare providers. President Biden has endorsed it. Why do you think this bill has been received so positively at face value and garnered support from people on different sides of the aisle? It's because the problems that this bill is says it's trying to solve are real problems. And the anger at big tech companies that is shared across the political spectrum in Washington, D.C., is completely valid and legitimate and deserved. And so... I think that is really the important thing to understand is big tech is harming our kids. They are harming our democracy. The problem is that COSA will make that situation worse rather than better. Mm -hmm. We need to address the harm of big tech by going after the surveillance capitalist business model that is at the root of their harm rather than by empowering 
right wing bigoted attorneys general to dictate what our kids can see online. We can address the harms of big tech without throwing trans kids and other marginalized communities under the bus. The way we do that is by regulating surveillance rather than speech. So just to give an example, um, you know, Cody was just mentioning the way that these platforms are algorithmically amplifying content that glorifies eating disorders, right? That's a real problem. And nobody sitting here right. opposing COSA is saying that that's not happening. The way that we address that is by making it illegal for companies to spy on our kids and use the data that they collect to recommend content to those kids. It doesn't then bring in the potential that it could be weaponized or used for censorship. Right. The worst thing that could happen is Mark Zuckerberg might lose some money. Boo-hoo. I'm, I'm crying here, right? Um, and so I just think it's important when we go into thinking through tech policies, it's good to ask ourselves, what's the worst thing that could happen if mm. this goes wrong? And when we're regulating surveillance, the worst thing that could happen is some of the largest corporations in the U.S. could lose a little bit of money. When we talk about regulating speech, the worst things that can happen are pretty bad. And they come down on marginalized communities and people who are already facing systemic oppression, violence, and discrimination in our society. Yeah, I, I really want to emphasize and, and lift up what Evan was saying, that many of the harms that we are seeing discussed in this conversation can be traced back to the use and abuse of our personal information. And so providing people with the opportunity to control the data that's collected on them is a key measure. And we've seen over the course of the past uh, few years that Congress has made important strides in that area. Unfortunately, for folks who are trying to push this particular avenue of regulation, uh, there is no constitu constitutional exception because the right mm. thing is the hard thing. And so in this particular case, it's time that Congress revisit combating commercial surveillance and revisit providing everyone with robust privacy protections. I love that you're not just explaining the problem. You're already providing a solution here, which is so helpful because I think it's really easy to say, okay, COSA is not it, but it's much harder to say what is it. So I really appreciate that. One thing I wanted to bring up is that as it goes with a lot that we discuss on the podcast, oftentimes we are concerned about vague and broad language when used in lawmaking. For example, you could think about a lot of the abortion bans. They leave a lot of room for interpretation about when someone can access an abortion, leaving doctors and more often hospitals to fear legal implications and overact perhaps to provide less abortions than even some of the most restrictive laws allow. When you look at COSA, my understanding is that this term, mature content, is used to explain what children should be shielded from. Well, what's mature content and how do platforms then overcorrect, perhaps, for all that could be interpreted as mature content by each state's respective attorney general? Is this a fair interpretation or concern? Yeah, and I would say also because it's attempting to legislate things that are sort of objectively subjective, if you will, right? So just thinking about my kid and, you know, her experience, there are pieces of content that she might find profoundly depressing or anxiety provoking that a different kid would be totally fine with and vice versa, right? So the idea that there is just like one objective truth that like this type of content makes kids depressed and this type of content makes kids less depressed is just not true. And that depending on where you live, that there might be a, someone different deciding that, right? Exactly. And it very much depends, you know, and when we're giving this authority to attorneys general, we're then saying the top law enforcement officer in your state gets to decide whether they think certain types of content is helpful or harmful to kids. And again, going back to Marsha Blackburn, lead sponsor of the bill, believes that learning about our nation's legacy of slavery is harmful to kids. The attorney general of her state is actively trying to criminalize drag performances, claiming that drag performances are harmful to kids. This is not something that there is like a legal based consensus definition of that you can, you know, then kind of like rely and say like, well, the courts will, will sort it out and get it right. Um, 
That is not how this works. And then I think the other thing to understand is on the platform side, how are they going Mm -hmm. to react, right? And we actually know basically how they'll react because we have some history on this. So some of your listeners may remember SESTA-FOSTA, which was uh, the last major piece of internet regulation really that has been passed in this country and the only amendment to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This was a bill that was framed as being about cracking down on online facilitation of Mm -hmm. sex trafficking. Again, something that no reasonable person would be against. Unfortunately, what SESTA-FOSTA did was not make it easier to prosecute actual facilitation of online sex trafficking. It just subjected platforms with vague liability for content that could be construed as facilitating Mm -hmm. sex trafficking. And what that led to was platforms engaging in massive over-removal of content that was vaguely sexual in nature just to avoid getting sued. So Craigslist shut down their entire personal section. Tumblr banned all adult content from their platform. That included, for example, videos about sexual health and how to avoid getting an STI, which had absolutely nothing to do with facilitating sex trafficking. But the platform is not willing to take on the risk to allow that type of content. That's exactly what we'll see with COSA, but for a much broader range of content. Now platforms will be in a position of proactively censoring or filtering content related to young people talking about their experiences with eating disorders, young people talking about their experiences with substance abuse or bullying or sexual abuse. Um, We're not helping young people by shutting down discussion of some of the most important and difficult topics that young people actually need to be able to talk about and learn about. Um, We're doing them a disservice in making their lives less safe, not more safe. And I think the really broad range of speech that could be impacted by this duty of care and COSIS provisions really underscores why the constitutional requirement is that when the government seeks to play with speech, it really needs to be exacting about what it's talking about. But here, the sort of political compromise has been to use very broad language and allow sort of each policymaker to choose their own adventure as to what sort of uh, content that it's going to target. And one of the key questions I always ask whenever I see the government seeking to regulate areas of speech or politics or orthodoxy is, what would this bill actually require? And it's almost impossible to decipher from COSA what it actually requires. And that's one of the reasons I think we've seen this appeal is people can sort of paint onto it what they are envisioning. And unfortunately, that's not what's allowed by the Constitution, where the government really needs to be specific about what it's trying to do here. Cody, that's exactly where I was going to go. The constitutional test is about if you're going to censor some kind of speech that would be narrowly tailored to your interests. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And that comes from a line of cases of previous attempts to regulate speech online in the name of children's safety. And all the old things are new again, where back then they were using terms like harmful to children or indecency. And the Supreme Court made a couple of things very, very clear. One, simply naming the type of content you want to go after because of its impact on listeners doesn't get you around the First Amendment. You're going to be subject to the same sort of rigorous scrutiny that any sort of attack on speech would be subject to. And Kendall, you've got the test exactly right. We call it strict scrutiny because it's very demanding on the government. And one of the things they have to show is is that the, the regulation is narrowly tailored to the sort of compelling interests that the government wants to achieve. And that means that the regulation can neither sweep in more speech than is necessary, nor leave some of the harms out. And when you think about some of the harms that Evan was talking about, say, eating disorders, there's whole swaths of the media industry and other industries that are being left unregulated here. The Senate isn't trying to address fitness supplements. They're not trying to address airbrushing in magazines. So many of the harms that they are purportedly trying to address are leaving are being left unaddressed because of the very specific focus on online speech. I think it's important to explain that the backers of COSA will sort of say that they're avoiding this First Amendment problem because COSA only recommends, only regulates content recommendation and not the content itself. And this is a, mm. a kind of important thing to unpack because it's basically a, 
a distinction without a difference. You know, I completely agree with folks back in COSA that the fundamental problem with big tech companies is the way that they deploy algorithms that are maximized for engagement. Right. So we're all kind of in agreement that that is the core of the problem. Now, what COSA's duty of care attempts to do is to say, your content recommendation system can't lead to these types of outcomes. And COSA supporters are sort of saying, no, 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 that's not regulating the content. That's just regulating the content recommendation system. But when you start to think about how this actually plays out in court or how a platform can react to this liability, it very much becomes about Mm -hmm. the content because they now have to ask themselves, it's not just, is our content recommendation system designed for engagement? It's also, does our content recommendation system prevent users who are minors from seeing content that an AG could claim leads to these types of outcomes? There is no distinction between the government trying to regulate speech and the government trying to regulate how speech is shown to people, right? It would be sort of like them saying like, well, we're not allowed to like tell this newspaper that they can't run this story, but we are allowed to tell them they have to run it on the third page and not on the front page. And so all that to say is that like, there are things that we can do to regulate these companies and address their harm. The First Amendment is kind of a juggernaut. And like, we can't just bury our heads in the sand and pretend it's not there. Um, We have to contend with it and think through how do we regulate these platforms without running afoul of our nation's First Amendment, which is one of the strongest um, pieces of law that we have and is there for a reason to protect people's civil liberties and free expression. That's a really important distinction. I also think it's really interesting that we're talking about this all very theoretically. But if you ask any young person who's on TikTok to ask them like, okay, well, what if all this kind of content stopped showing up in their FYP on TikTok and they're the main feed where TikTok is suggesting content to you, they would be like, oh, that's devastating. <laughs> like, you would never see it. You would never see that kind of content. So I do think it's it's helpful sometimes to just like, ground this in the actual an actual example of what what we mean when we say suggested content or how a platform will offer up a, a suggested of what to see next. I want to turn a little bit to talking about how this specifically targets uh, LGBTQ young people because I think also what we haven't touched on yet is that some of this impact is really going to impact young people. We talked about the mental health crisis, um, but a recent study from the Trevor Project found that young LGBTQ people who feel safe and understood in online spaces are 20% less likely to have attempted suicide in the last year. Um, And that reflective content is actually really beneficial for young people's mental health. And, And Evan, I really would love to turn to you just to talk about the unique benefits of digital spaces to the LGBTQ community and the risk that COSA poses to them specifically. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, this is pretty personal. I'm kind of in that like bridge generation where like when I was very young, when I was my kid's age, I didn't have the internet. And then once I was sort of like in high school and a little bit older, I did have access to the internet. And so like, I don't need a study to tell me that like access to online community and resources for LGBTQ folks can be a lifeline um, because it was my own experience. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of other folks of my generation, um, who remember what it was like before we had access to, um, be able to find other people who've shared our experiences, or even frankly, just to be able to find someone else to date. Um, if you live in a more rural area or don't live in a big city or in a particularly progressive, um, community. And so I think, you know, there's a degree to which just a lot of us, you know, understand this sort of intrinsically. That said, there is also data there. Right. The Surgeon General, um, in their report that they recently put out, showed that for one specific group of young people, it's actually documented that access to social media improves their mental health outcomes. And that's for LGBTQ youth. I think it's also important to just parallel what's happening online with what we're seeing right. across the country, where We see local state legislatures, school boards, attorneys general, they're banning books, they're banning content, 
they're very much focused on keeping kids away from this type of community. Now they frame that community as indoctrination or, you know, poisoning kids' minds. What we know is that um, access to just knowing that there are other people out there like you, that there are other people like you that grew up and became grownups and have jobs and like, um, you know, have healthy, healthy, happy lives is incredibly important for young folks. And I think, again, when we think about harms, COSA yeah. really focuses in on this like prohibitionist model, right? Of like the way we protect kids from harm is by yes. isolating them and cutting them off from learning about the world around them. And we actually know that the exact opposite is true. The more kids know about the world around them, the more equipped they are to navigate it safely. Unfortunately, COSA is basically just trying to recreate abstinence-only sex education, but for all of these other incredibly important topics like bullying and substance use that kids do need to be able to talk about, even when they make adults uncomfortable. And that's really what I think this is about in the end, is basically a bunch of hand-wringing adults being uncomfortable with the fact that young people have some agency mm. um, and can speak up and make some of their own decisions about how they feel about this stuff. Um, and I wish that lawmakers in D.C. spent more time listening to young people about what they actually want and need. Because when you you can actually just go on TikTok or whatever and hear what they have to say about COSA, they're worried about authority figures in their life um, dictating their ability to access information and communicate, um, which is true for all the rest of us, too. It turns out kids are not that different. Yeah than everyone else. They want basic rights and freedom and some privacy almost, and they deserve Almost it. like they're people. <laughs> almost like kids are people. <laughs> almost. Um, you know, I think this also just, it, it follows this national trend that we've seen across the country, um, specifically within school contexts. So here again, we're seeing the encroachment of what can students learn? And we've talked about this, but it's all done under this veil of quote unquote protecting children. This is part of a decades-long trend of falsely conflating LGBTQ identity with predatory behavior. Um, and that is, again, nothing new. Um, and it's actually sort of gone through several cycles. Like if we go back to even like the gay marriage fight um, and before that, um, there was an active attempt by the right in this country and by religious institutions to effectively conflate just being gay with pedophilia, mm -hmm. effectively. Um, since then, um, basically those same groups have zeroed in on trans people and are trying to focus on trans people going to the bathroom as conflated mm -hmm. with pedophilia. Trans people playing sports as conflated with some type of predatory, manipulative, abusive behavior. Um, but in a lot of ways, again, nothing new about this. Very, very much the same. And that's why we always need to be vigilant um, when folks are kind of papering whatever um, their type of government control they want to create is in that wrapping paper of protecting the kids. Um, and then I think it's also, again, important to, to zoom out a little bit and say, well, if these folks are so interested in protecting kids, surely they also support um, massive investment in more counselors in schools. Oh, wait, they don't? That's weird. If these folks care so much about protecting kids, surely they also support ensuring every child in this country has access to health care. Oh, wait, they don't? That's kind of weird, right? If we wanted to do something to improve youth mental health, um, there are a lot of things that we could do right now, like ensuring that every young person in this country has access to a safe place to live, has access to a school um, that meets their educational needs. That would go way further toward addressing the youth mental health crisis than any lever that we think we can pull to ban content from the internet or allow more content on the internet. Um, but that's, you know, those are the types of conversations that folks in DC would rather not have, which is why they would rather kind of zero in on this, like, well, let's just pass some bill blaming the internet so we can say we did something. Thank you for that. In thinking about a solution, you both proposed the idea that we could look back at the problem of data surveillance that these platforms have engaged in as a, a way to uh, make the internet safer for young people. How are you both thinking about uh, COSA moving forward? Do you think it's going to pass? That's a great question, Kendall. And I think first, the sort of of litany of ideas that Evan just just rattled off right here on this podcast is a great place for Congress to start. 
the Supreme Court has been adamant that when it comes to regulating harms to society, regulating speech should be the last resort, not the first resort. And so rather than addressing the things that Evan identified, like providing counselors to kids, providing more tools to, to control your uh, your privacy online, we're sort of seeing the uh, Congress uh, skip all of those intermediary steps and go straight instead to attacking speech that they don't alike, don't like online. I am hopeful that Congress, as they consider the options before them, are going to return to those tools. We saw a little bit of glimmers of it in the last Congress, both in some of the big funding bills, uh, like the bipartisan uh, gun control uh, measures that provided funds limited to counselors in school, as well as the efforts there that were around privacy. I think that there are deep concerns about COSA, deep concerns about a number of other bills pending in the Senate. And I think senators are understanding that these particular bills are not the ones to solve these issues. And I hope that they don't falsely impose on themselves limitations but on the uh, that these are the only ones that they may consider. Instead, step back, recognize they still have a year and a half left in this Congress and get to the work to scoping a bill that will solve these issues without impeding constitutional rights. And then what would you say? To answer your first question, no, I do not think COSA is going to pass. It faces overwhelming opposition from civil liberties groups, from human rights groups. Um, you mentioned this a couple of times, but I haven't actually spoken to it yet. So I'll just quickly say that you know, my organization helped organize a letter that's now been signed by almost 300 parents of transgender and gender, gender expansive youth. That letter specifically asks on Congress not just to oppose COSA, but specifically to support alternatives to COSA, like privacy and antitrust legislation, because those parents are agreeing and saying, we agree that big tech is doing harm to kids. It's doing harm to our kids too. We believe that COSA will make that harm worse, not better. I think if we want to protect kids online, we have to act like adults. And that means mm -hmm. sitting down and kind of figuring out, to be blunt, what is the Venn diagram of things that we can all live with. I think there are a lot of organizations that support COSA whose hearts are totally mm -hmm. in the right place. And we on the civil liberties side from ACLU and Fight for the Future and EFF and the dozens of LGBTQ and racial justice and human rights groups that we're working with, we legitimately believe that COSA will make kids mm -hmm. less safe and not more safe. This is a complicated issue, and it's one where reasonable people can disagree and where there are valid trade-offs. That, And sometimes it's genuinely hard to figure out, like, is this policy worth it? But the way that we figure that out is we sit down and we talk. And we ask ourselves, like, is there something that we have consensus around? And if lawmakers are serious about getting something done on this, um, then I think there are pieces of COSA that are salvageable. And, you know, there is appetite to see something positive happen in this area, to rein in these companies and address the harm that they're doing without throwing trans youth and other marginalized communities under the bus. I believe that's possible. Um, and I invite lawmakers and, and everyone that cares about this to, to try to sit down so that we can figure it out. Well, it sounds like we have our marching orders. Evan, Cody, thank you both so much for joining me. Uh, really appreciate your time. And thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by Matt Boynton. Julia Silva-Forbes is our intern. Until next week, stay strong. Thank you.